flying, serene, swift, and weightless. Well, it does take strength and energy, especially when taking off, but it does pay off. Flying opens up new hunting methods and feeding grounds. Flying also allows for safe nests at lofty heights. And most importantly, by escaping into the air, you can evade your enemies. And yet, there are birds that prefer to travel on foot. Some 40 species have given up flying. Like the shaggy kiwis, the primeval South Island takahes, and the gigantic ostriches. But what are the advantages? Isn't it wonderful to fly? Why would you want to do without it? Everyone prepares for a new day in their own way. The cattle egret starts with some balancing exercises. The widder with air acrobatics. This is the savannah, home to the largest birds on earth. The male ostrich is a little darker and larger than the female. Both weigh over 100 kilos. They share the herbage with many other grazing animals and if there is any, the water too. Coming together as a mixed group has its advantages. Antelopes have excellent hearing, zebras have a great sense of smell and ostriches have extraordinary vision. A panoramic view without even moving your head. Nothing escapes them from a height of two and a half meters. They do in fact have the largest eyes of all land dwellers. The baboon is alone and not a threat. The guinea fowls are constantly preoccupied with themselves. but this predator demands caution. However, the hyena is trotting along calmly. Spirit of the hunt? Not really. If need be, one has to be able to run. In this respect, nothing can beat ostriches. They are the best endurance sprinters on earth, managing to run up to 20 minutes at over 60 kilometers an hour. Swift legs made for escaping are vital in the savannah. Even the young new to this world begin their life circle by hitting the ground running. This is exactly where ostriches are at a loss. As birds, they lay eggs. And eggs, after all, can't run. And how do they bring up their offspring, unprotected in the savannah? As the breeding season approaches, ostrich roosters' legs and beaks redden. These are outward signs of their inner state. And now they become aggressive. It's necessary to mark out territory in which rivals have no business. They show off what they have in a display of virility. And if that doesn't do the trick... Mm. 
Mating season fills the blood with adrenaline. Ostriches are not alone in feeling the rush of its effects. And there's something brewing in the skies above. They all seem to know what's coming. Water from above cools their tempers. Everyone gets wet in their own way. The rivalries are flushed away. A relaxed neighborhood. Who owns what territory? That all now seems resolved. As often in early summer, the shower doesn't last long. The weather is extremely variable. And with the light, lust returns. Now the ostrich rooster, with his red legs, courts the hen. Her, with spread wings, an especially alluring gesture. And he knows what is expected of him. He throws himself at her feet and shows his talents. He cries out with all his might, offering himself up as her partner. success. She seems impressed and invites him to mate on the spot. It's not always this energetic and long-lived, but these two seem to be made for each other. The only question is, for how long? Will they stay together? Or will they each, as is more usual, go their separate ways? Only a few moments pass, then all is made clear. With trembling wings, both of them signal their intention to give it a go together. It almost looks as if the two of them want to tie the knot. All this can, of course, be achieved with a little less effort. All it takes for the bee-eaters is a freshly caught insect. Small gifts can also seduce. The ostrich couple have built their nest in the meadow. Just a hollow in the ground, nothing more. The first egg already wants to see the light of day. It takes less than a minute. A bit of pushing, a bit of groaning, then she lays the cornerstone for a new family. All has been set in motion, and everything seems to be on track. Every other day she lays another egg, and the hollow in the ground is filling up. As a nest owner, she can be pleased. Her work is done. Her neighbors, on the other hand, are still courting and mating all around her. 
Without settling permanently or building their own nests, the females must find somewhere to lay their eggs. And so it happens that the nest owner in this meadow receives some company. Lady visitors from the vicinity. And since the visitor is also carrying eggs, trouble is in store. Now there are another two who also want to offload their eggs. The three of them now try to get the hen to stand up and don't quite play fair. As soon as the nest has been vacated, one of the hens lowers herself to lay her own egg with the others. The other two are jostling for their chance. Done. One more egg and all finished. Then the next one with one more egg. And finally, the last one, a third egg. And they're off. This adds up to 20 to 30 eggs, those of the visitors and her own, far more than the hen could have laid herself. And now the actual brooding starts. Rooster and hen both take turns. She has some time off now to stretch her legs and above all to eat. Grass seeds, insects, everything is added into her throat pouch unchewed. And from time to time, a few stones. Just like grinding stones, they help to mince the food when the contents of the throat pouch finally slide into the stomach. Lunch break is over. Rooster and hen greet each other at the nest, chattering before the changing of the guard ritual. Both need to be able to depend on each other, Alone, the eggs would not hatch. The nest needs shade from the hot sun and warmth in the cold nights. The eggs should also be rolled and moved from time to time. This is just a precaution to avoid what's inside sticking together, helping it better develop. In short, the eggs need round-the-clock protection and care. The rooster now has a few hours off and uses them for an extensive search for food. He strips the grass clean of seeds, which is more useful than pecking at the ground. After all, he doesn't want to go hungry when it's his turn on nest duty. But he somehow forgets the time and returns late. Understandably, his partner at home reacts indignantly and rushes off as soon as he approaches without a greeting. First off, he has to solve a puzzle and fit as many eggs as possible under his plumage. Not so easy when your brain is smaller than your eye. One last adjustment. And everything fits. Or perhaps there's one last little touch.
Eggs outside of the nest are in jeopardy. Their chance of developing is lower and there is also interest from other parties. But how to open the egg? The hyena's jaws are too small. A bit of football might help. And a goal. One crack in the shell and it can be pried open with the teeth. This egg made a good breakfast, but now perhaps for something a little more substantial. The Cory Bustard may be sluggish. It weighs 20 kilos and prances like a little ostrich. But when it really matters, which it does now, it simply takes off. The Cory Bustard Africa's heaviest bird that's still able to fly. That's something ostriches can only dream of. Have they become too heavy? Is this the reason they can no longer get airborne? It can't be as simple as that because there are featherweights that do without flying, as seen in New Zealand's Afifauna. New Zealand is not only a magnificent place on Earth, but is also highly volatile. Hot springs, volcanoes and earthquakes are a testament to the tectonic forces beneath. 70 million years ago, these forces separated New Zealand from the Australian continent and drove it into the Pacific Ocean like a gigantic raft. It was random chance that there were no mammals on this raft, no nimble and dangerous predators. The development of life in New Zealand took a very special path. This is where unique reptiles like the Tuatara originate. This is also where giant insects crawl through the undergrowth. And it is where some birds, like the ostrich, have given up flying altogether. For instance, the famous kiwis, New Zealand's national bird. In contrast to the ostriches, they are small, hardly larger than crows. Being overweight can't be their reason for walking. At night and under a full moon and a low tide, kiwis like to trek to the beach, where there are plenty of larvae and eggs in the sand. And this shows why they gave up flying. Wings are useless when it comes to poking in the ground for larvae and worms. And when there are no dangerous predators around, there's no need for an aerial escape. For the kiwis, walking pays off. They save the energy that is required for flying. They've even discarded the wings themselves, wingless throughout the night. Their little trip to the beach is coming to an end. Time for one more sip for the road and back into the woods. Little birds, but big runners. A kiwi is not swept off its feet that easily. 
New Zealand, the land where birds walk, many of them at least. The waker rail could, in terms of size, easily fly off into the air. Yet going on foot is more useful. Doing this, it leaves no stone unturned in its search for food. Eventually, it finds the meagre remains of a mussel. Surely there must be better than this. Hopping, not flying, to the chowder. A bird through and through, except for its inability to fly. The takahe hides in high tufts of the tussock grass. An especially primeval bird whose ancient roots are visible in its appearance. It too is a pedestrian. Just like the kiwi, it picks its food off the ground. It is a grazer and so well-mannered that it uses its feet to eat. And since again there are no predators, there's no need to fly. Flying might be nice, but also a waste of energy. Better to invest that elsewhere like fostering chicks, for example. New Zealand's examples show that with a lack of predators, even running is an option for birds. But in Africa, no one can say there's a lack of predators. One might think this would be the worst environment imaginable for flightless birds. The caracal even hunts flying birds by leaping high into the air. This nest is hanging a little low for safety. The savannah, with its powerful predators and flightless ostriches. How does this add up? This ostrich and its mate have made it unscathed so far. Rooster and hen have taken turns. Over 20 eggs in the nest, this could be a successful breeding season. Could. The darkness is particularly filled with danger. It's seemingly quiet among the trees. A mob of baboons spends the night in the branches, but its proximity to the ostrich nest is no coincidence. They wait until dawn, before they begin their raid. The light of day reveals the full extent of the damage. What was once fostered so carefully is now scattered and broken. 
The parents seem perplexed. But others are enjoying it. This egg frenzy goes on for hours. Scooping with one hand, well-mannered with delicate fingers. By all means, greedy. But others also want a piece of the action. The warthogs dig in. But now, it makes its entrance. The Egyptian vulture. It spotted an egg that's still safe and sound. It's much too hard for its beak. This could be a solution. If it hits the mark. The next throw is too weak, but its choice of method and tool was instinctively correct. In this manner, the vulture eventually reaches the egg's yolk all at the expense of the ostriches, who have been robbed of their brood. The Kiwis and others must have it better. Or so you might think in New Zealand's bird paradise without enemies or egg thieves. Which is how it was until 1,000 years ago when seafarers discovered the country and they in turn brought others along on their ships. It wasn't long until the stowaway rats had conquered the whole archipelago, facing no rivalry and finding prey in abundance. The kiwis were hit hardest of all, as they, like the rats, are nocturnal. Cats were supposed to decimate the rats, but instead of hunting rodents, they went for the clumsy chicks of the flightless birds. Possums, introduced for fur farming, were then added to the mix. Though they forage for vegetation, they prefer to eat eggs and chicks. With this, bird paradise turned to hell for flightless birds. And then came the martins, imported from England as a supposed bioweapon against runaway rabbits and their frenetic breeding. Sadly, the result was the same. The martins ignored the rabbits, preferring eggs and the chicks on a richly dressed table. These imported predators caught the flightless birds completely unawares. The number of kiwis is decreasing particularly rapidly. They are anything but prolific in their reproduction, usually only laying one egg per year. The future does indeed look grim for New Zealand's flightless birds. But what is different in Africa? 
Despite the raids and egg theft, ostriches are not widely considered as endangered. There are losses, of course. Both have completely lost their young to a troop of monkeys. This year, they are left bereft, with no chicks. Yet unlike in New Zealand, these ostriches are consistently able to make up for their losses. Our couple have their own success story. The first chicks have hatched and more are to come. New to this world and still a little dizzy, they have to stand on their own two feet. And peck on their own or they don't get fed. Of course, they run the risk of some things not being quite to their taste. The smallest chicks in nature compared to the size of their parents. And the parents have their hands full. In addition to the chicks bustling around them, they also have to protect the other eggs and keep them warm. Having offspring in eggs forces the ostrich couple to settle down. Mammals like the warthogs are more mobile. At first carried inside, after which it simply runs alongside. Self-service guaranteed. Yet nutritious milk requires nutritious food. A little meat with the grass wouldn't hurt. She would certainly not turn her nose up at a chick if only she could get hold of it. This applies to pure carnivores, like jackals all the more. Here they are the main predators of the ostrich chicks. but need to respect the wary parents. Now the ostriches are on the move as well, having left their nest for the last time. The group of chicks is almost invisible in the grass and one parent always keeps an eye on their surroundings and a pebble in between to help with digestion. A small pebble. Every failed attempt is a lesson, but green grass turns out to be everyone's favorite. These hungry chicks won't stop foraging. Birds are not ruminant, or they would be able to take a break and snooze while they chew. Rubbish collection takes place from time to time. It's quite likely that the orb also contains ostrich dung. Walking is much better on the road. Even the dung beetles seem to know this. On smooth sand, they can really get the ball rolling. There's heavy traffic. There's nothing to eat on the carriageway, but importantly, walking swiftly trains the legs. If you can keep up. This little straggler is having a hard time, but the parents are patiently waiting. They know that the road is dangerous for youngsters, less due to traffic than the lack of cover of the grass.
but you can also be spotted in the high grass. From above, from a bird's eye view, The parents summon the flock of chicks. Shielded by the parents, no bird of prey would dare attack now. The chicks' top priority, stick together. Straying from the group can lead to an unhappy ending. But when there's new things to be found, and you stray ever further, and suddenly you don't know where you are. When the grass blocks your view and your parents can be neither seen nor heard, This won't end well. And to top it all off, a storm is approaching. The other chicks are lucky that cosy shelter is nearby. The chicks' fuzzy plumage is all but waterproof. The parents are no strangers to these showers. They patiently await the end of the thunderstorm. Can we go now? Too soon. Well, perhaps now. Now. Preparing for the next leg of the journey. A family with many children. Do they know that one is missing? The sun has long since gained the upper hand. Around noon, temperatures rise to over 40 degrees. The lost chick survived the storm, but it's been weakened. Scorching heat is burning down on it. The end of a brief life. Midday heat is weighing heavily on the savannah. All who can are searching for a place to rest. Even the chicks are now taking breaks more often. Even a flightless bird can't walk all the time. Something has caught this caracal's attention. Oh. 
it tries to resuscitate the dead chick in its own particular way. The crowned plovers are nervous and start to attack the ostrich couple. Strange, since the ostriches are not their enemies and the small plovers can do no harm to these giants. So why are they doing this? The plovers have offspring too and fear for a large ostrich foot striking one of their flightless young accidentally. So far, so good. They annoy the large birds until they change their course and move on. Exasperated, the ostriches head in a different direction. This tail unfortunately came out of this a little worse for wear. Ostrich chicks are defenseless and their size makes them ideal prey. Even for omnivores like warthogs, There's no question that danger is looming. The father stays with the chicks, while ostrich mother attends to the warthogs. One kick from her could easily kill them but they're saved by their agile turns. The golden evening provides the illusion that all is calm and peaceful. It is, however, the hour of the jackal. Vigilant and mistrustful, the ostrich couple continues searching for a place to spend the night. They dig out a hollow with their wings so their young can have safe shelter. Predators lurk, awaiting their chance. For the ostriches, it will be a long and watchful night. The flightless birds of New Zealand are in a very different position and would be lost without the help of human beings. Many tons of rat poison are widely dispersed every year. The bait is there to take the pressure off the kiwis whose future hangs in the balance. The Martin issue is also being tackled with specially constructed traps. 
a chicken egg as visible bait along with some meat. Then, just as with a mouse trap, the bar is cocked. Now all it needs is a marten. John and his Kiwi dog, Jet, are taking an entirely different tack. As a ranger, he looks after the birds and fosters them. He's fitted his Kiwis with transmitters so he can locate at least their general whereabouts. But now he's in for a surprise. The Kiwi dog lives up to its name and tracks down a new Kiwi burrow. And it's even inhabited. With a skillful grip on the legs, John now has one more fosterling. He first needs to calm it, and then weigh it. Almost two kilos, that's perfect. A healthy one too, and back into the den. John is going to take it under his wing, as it has none of its own. Much has happened at the Martin front line, or so scientist Inas Pokema is hoping. The bar killed it instantly. It's a pity for the beautiful animal, but New Zealand's heraldic bird would soon be something of the past without addressing the problem of the Martins. Without rescue measures, the Takahe would also already be extinct. At first glance, it seems that these birds live in the wild. But they are in fact trapped behind gigantic fences and thus safe from predators like rats, cats or martins. Living behind a fence as if in a time capsule without foreign predators. In this way, New Zealanders are doing their best to save them from extinction. What's so different in Africa? What's the ostrich's secret? And why is their population status of so little concern in spite of feline predators, apes and hyenas? Despite their chicks being so vulnerable and despite being rooted to the ground for their entire lives. Mother and father would have liked a little more peace and quiet. But once again, it's the chicks that demand a start to the day. They want to head off, even if their parents aren't quite ready yet. The little chicks have a hard time, and only one in ten will survive to adulthood, a shockingly low number. And yet the ostriches survive in their own right. Their secret to success is in their past. Ostriches have a history spanning millions of years. They lost their ability to fly far back in the past, back when predators were small and harmless. They had nothing to fear from them, to the contrary in fact. As predators became stronger, faster, and able to jump higher, they evolved in synchrony.
they also gain tremendously in weight and size, which an animal no longer needing to fly can afford. They even developed a faster foot with only two toes, able to always stay ahead of their enemies. When sprinting, they use their tiptoes and manage four meter paces. Little wonder that grown up ostriches have practically no enemies. What's problematic is the high mortality rate of the chicks. As a countermeasure, they create large nests filled by multiple hens. In this way, they can offset losses with a greater number of chicks. And even if they lose their offspring, ostriches can live for over 30 years, allowing for multiple breeding seasons. This too is a strategy that has ensured their survival. Africa's flightless birds have a long history that they share with their adversaries. In stark contrast with New Zealand, they have been able to evolve with their enemies and coexist with them, flying high without taking off. <laughs>